welcome everyone to Travel Tuesday uh, for the fabulous tour company Australians Studying Abroad. I'm delighted to welcome you all tonight for the talk that I'm going to be giving on highlights of literary France. But I'd like to begin this evening by welcoming particularly and introducing to you, uh, as I've been doing with all of these talks, a member of the ASA team, and that is Julie Whiteley. Now, Julie is the person who very frequently answers the telephone when you ring up and make a booking, particularly for my tours. Julie has become a very dear friend. She is the most amazing person in that she welcomes everybody to ASA. She makes everybody feel special and important. She really is, I think, a fabulous asset to the country. So, Julie, I'd like you just to say a few words about your role in ASA and you know what, what you enjoy about working for ASA. So thank you, Susanna. That's very kind of you. And it's great to have the opportunity to say hello to you all face to face. So many names that have been familiar to me for so many years. So chances are if you've travelled on a literary tour with Susanna or you're about to travel or you've inquired about a tour, you will have come in contact with me over the past 20 years. So once Kristen and our tours department put together these fabulous programs and all the research that's involved, it's my role to make the booking process as easy as possible and to make sure you have everything that you need when you get to start on day one. I'm a passionate reader, an avid reader, and so I love these programs. I've loved travelling with Susanna and I love following the stories of people. So many of you have travelled on multiple tours with her, so I love the stories of, of the different itineraries you've chosen. I love to hear what happens on tour. I love to see some photos and it's been a great passion of mine. So hello to all of you who've travelled in the past and hello to the lucky group members who are about to go to Scotland and Scandinavia shortly and to England later in the year. And let's just enjoy listening to Susanna and I hope you're inspired to travel with her to France. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Julie. Julie really is a very special friend and part of the ASA team. So normally what I do now is introduce the speaker, but I don't really need to introduce myself at any great length. I have been lucky enough to be leading tours for Australians studying abroad for about 20 years. I've taken tours to France, of course, to England, Scotland, Ireland, to Italy, Scandinavia, New Zealand, the USA, Canada, and also during COVID tours in Australia. I feel incredibly privileged to be working for such an, a very well-organised, well-run professional company. So I have loved doing my tours because ASA gives me always such amazing backup from the office. They do the bookings and the planning and the working out of all the itinerary in such incredible detail for me. And I really am very grateful indeed that I have such a wonderful tour company with which to lead my tours. So tonight I'm going to be talking to you about my forthcoming tour in May, June of next year on literary northern France. When we hear the name France, all sorts of wonderful things come to mind. France has more tourists than any other country in the world, and that, of course, is for very good reason. We visit France for the wonderful food. We go for the magnificent art and the amazing architecture. We visit France for the fashion, for the gorgeous villages, and of course, for the great city of Paris. But what I do on my tours is to go to France for the literature. And I think that's a really wonderful way to see the country because we see so many extraordinary places we delve into the lives and the works of great writers, and we have a really fantastic time. So let me take you through some of the great places of the literature of France. This is one of the places that we start off with on my literary tour of France. It's in a little tiny town called Villers Cotteret, fairly close to the border with Belgium. And it was in this house in the year 1802, in the month of July, that one of the great French novelists was born, Alexandre Dumas. This was the home of his grandparents. So his mother ended up going back to her parents in order to give birth to her baby. And so we have this birthplace. 
We can't get inside the birthplace, but we can stand outside the gates and admire this very charming little house where began the very extraordinary life of one of France's great historical novelists. In the town, he is, of course, wonderfully commemorated. This is a statue that stands in the central marketplace of Villiers Cotteret. Dumas, looking very dramatic with his cape, throughout his life had to face quite a lot of racial prejudice. His grandmother was a black slave. And here you can see a portrait of Dumas. He became phenomenally famous during his lifetime. So every word, every item of clothing that he bought, every restaurant he ate in, all of these things were hugely discussed throughout his lifetime. Now, his father, Thomas Alexandre Dumas, was a general in Napoleon's army, and he himself was a very fascinating man. He was extremely tall and strong, and it's said that Alexandre Dumas, in his novel The Three Musketeers, modelled the very strong character of Porthos after his father. But his father died when Alexandra was only a very small boy, so in many ways he mythologized his father within his writings. In Villiers Cotteret, there is an excellent Dumas museum which covers Thomas Alexandre Dumas, Alexandre Dumas himself, and then his son, Alexandre Dumas Fils, who also became a novelist and a playwright. So it's a wonderful museum to visit. Now, the other thing that we visit is Alexandre Dumas' grave in the little cemetery of Villiers Cotteret. But Dumas' body is actually no longer in that grave, in spite of what it says on the gravestone. Dumas' body got yeah. moved around quite a lot. <laughs> He died in another part of France at the time of the Franco-Prussian War, so burying him in his birthplace was not possible at that time. His body then got moved so that he was buried in his birthplace of Villiers Cotteret. And many, many years later, in the time of President Chirac, Dumas' body was moved to the Pantheon in Paris. Now, it's thought he was not originally buried in the Pantheon because of his black heritage, and France was still very racially prejudiced. But he now rests in the Pantheon, so that grave that we go and visit is actually empty of his body. So it's all a rather fascinating story. Now, we move on, not too far away from Villiers Cotteret, to a fascinating town called charleville Mezier. And this is famous because of the great French poet Arthur Rimbaud, who was sort of the bad boy of French literature. And one of the places that we visit is this really magnificent town square in charleville mezieres And uh, this is called the Place Ducal. It was actually designed by the brother of the man who designed the Place de Vosges in Paris, another magnificent example of town planning. And Rambo was very familiar with this town square. He liked to upset people in the town square as frequently as he could. One of his favorite activities was flicking lice from his hair onto priests as they walked past him in the square. So as you can see, he was very much a, a bad boy who loved upsetting people. Now, one of the places that we visit in that museum is the Rambo Museum. And there in the picture on the left, you can see a photograph of Arthur Rimbaud as a young man and the other great French poet, Paul Verlaine. And their lives are very intertwined. The two men fell in love with each other. Verlaine was married to somebody else. They ended up having a fairly tempestuous affair. Uh, guns were involved in a shooting incident, which was all very controversial. But uh, the two men had a really fascinating time together and greatly inspired each other's wonderful poetry. So it's important to bear both of these poets in mind and we visit places connected with each of them. This is the beautiful Rambo Museum in charleville mezieres It's an old mill over the river and it has been turned into a truly fascinating museum. So there's another picture of the front of the museum, which you know, basically is placed over the river. Uh, and it looks at the life of Rimbaud, who as a young man wrote extraordinary revolutionary poetry, 
and then basically gave it up after that. Uh, he died fairly young, but in the last years of his life, he wrote no poetry whatsoever. Uh, but really, he, he revolutionized French poetry. He was a symbolist. He did truly extraordinary things in his writing. And there's a picture of the inside of the Rimbaud Museum, lots of uh, photographs of Rimbaud as a young man. He went traveling at an early age and traveled to all sorts of unusual places and really led a, a very different and very tempestuous life indeed. And this is one of his most famous quotes. And if you know the French language, you would be aware immediately that there is a mistake in this sentence. Normally you would say, je suis un autre, I am somebody else. But Rambo was always breaking the rules, including in grammar. And this is one of his most famous lines, je ai un autre, I is someone else. So I think this gives you an idea of what a, a difficult, challenging, groundbreaking sort of personality Rimbaud actually was. This is a famous portrait by the great artist Henri Toulouse-Lautrec. And down there in the bottom left-hand corner, you can see the poet Verlaine. And next to him, with his chin in his hand, uh, is Rimbaud. They're there with a, a group of some of the important literary people in Paris of the day. Here we see the two men together, Rimbaud there in the, uh, in the hat on the right and the white jacket and Verlaine on the left. It was a very tempestuous affair which actually involved Verlaine shooting at Rimbaud and having to go to prison for a while as a result. So uh, uh, certainly not an easy relationship. And this is one of Rimbaud's most famous poems, and it's called Voyelle, or Vowels. And he looks at the vowels of the alphabet, A-E-I-O-U, in terms of color. And he tries to reflect each of the vowels in different colors. So this is the actual manuscript, which you see in the Rambo Museum. And you learn more about what he was trying to achieve within his poetry, which was truly fascinating. As I mentioned, he went traveling. This is his suitcase, a much worn, well-used suitcase, the set of cutlery that he took with him when he went off to exotic places like Aden and Yemen. Uh, so he was a very well-traveled man. Eventually, he had a lot of health problems. He needed to come back to France. Uh, he had to actually have an amputation, and he died as a very young man, with very few of his poems published. Most of them were published after his death. And here you can see Artur Rimbaud's grave in the cemetery of Charleville-Mézières, a town that he never really liked very much. He always tried to upset the locals as much as he could. Uh, he had a very conflicted relationship with the town of his birth, but it is very fascinating and I think also very moving to visit his grave in the local cemetery. Now, one of the things that they have done in connection with the uh, Rambo Museum is to set out all of these chairs on the pavement. They're actually fixed into the pavement. Every chair is different and every chair faces different directions and is placed differently. And this is, a, I think, a very interesting way of reflecting Rambo's poetry with these chairs that are all different, all give you a slightly different viewpoint. Uh, so it's a rather wonderful way of reflecting a great writer. And there's another view of the beautiful museum. Uh, somebody sitting in one of those chairs all set out there on the pavement so that you get a different viewpoint every single time you sit down. Just along the road from where the chairs and the museum are is another museum to Rambo, a house that he actually ended up living in for a little while. So we visit that house as well. And we really get to know this bad boy of French literature. Now, we also visit places connected with Paul Verlaine. He did settle down after his tempestuous affair with Rambo. And he ended up living in this rather beautiful old farmhouse. So we visit this farmhouse. Uh, there's a wonderful young man who looks after it, who recites some of Verlaine's beautiful poetry to us. 
He's one of my very favourite of the French poets. And uh, to see the farmhouse, to see where he worked, where he wrote, is always a very moving experience indeed. We move on from there to visit a very different author, an author I'm sure you have all heard of, and if you haven't read his works, I'm sure you've at least seen a movie based on his books. And that's the great writer Jules Verne, who is credited by many people as being the father of science fiction. So with his books, you know, 80,000 Leagues Under the Sea, The First Men in the Moon, uh, and all those other fabulous novels that he wrote, he was an extremely influential writer within French literature. And this house with this rather extraordinary turret uh, is now in Amiens, the fabulous Jules Verne Museum. So we really enjoy a visit. You climb up into that turret. Uh, you see where he entertained many of his famous literary friends, people like Victor Hugo. And uh, it really is a fabulous house to visit as you learn more about Jules Verne's contribution to the history of literature. And that's a, a glimpse inside one of the upper rooms of the museum, all set up as if you're sailing on a ship. So you can see the, uh, uh, the steering wheel there and the sense that you're, you're setting off on a ship on voyages to unknown lands uh, along with Jules Verne. So it really is a very fascinating place to visit indeed. And very near to that is the magnificent Amiens Cathedral. It is one of the greatest cathedrals in the whole of France. According to John Ruskin, who was a real expert on architecture, this building is, quote, unsurpassable. And it truly is a magnificent cathedral. So we enjoy a guided tour of the cathedral. And in that central archway that you can see in the picture on the left, we can spend up to an hour just standing in that archway, looking at the amazing carvings around the archway, learning about the biblical stories that inspired them, learning about the people who did the carving. Uh, it really is a magnificent building. It was also a building that hugely inspired Marcel Proust. So we learn a bit about Proust and we have connections with Marcel Proust when we visit the wonderful cathedral in Amiens. Really is a fabulous place to visit. Uh, Scott Fitzgerald writes about this cathedral in Tender as the Night. Uh, so there's all sorts of interesting literary connections as we wander around this truly beautiful building. Now, this is a very interesting chateau. It is called the Chateau of Vasquez. And this was the home of an historian called Jules Michelet. And while he's not a name that's particularly familiar to many of us outside France, it is a name that is very important indeed within France because Michelet was an extremely influential historian. So we visit his home, we learn about his interest in French history, about the many different books that he wrote. He wrote a general history of France, but he wrote all sorts of books about aspects of French history, the revolution, the women of France, Joan of Arc. Uh, he was a very, very prolific writer. So when we visit that beautiful chateau, we learn a lot about this very important French historian. Now, one of the most famous novelists in all of French literature has to be Gustave Flaubert. And of course, his most famous book is Madame Bovary, that famous tale of adultery set in rural France. This is the beautiful little village of Ry, R-Y is how it is spelt. And this is the village that he had in mind as Madame Bovary's home village. So as we wander around the streets of this gorgeous little village, and it truly is very beautiful indeed, we can picture Emma Bovary frustrated in her marriage, longing for romance and excitement and more money and beautiful jewels and fabulous clothes, all those things that she never manages to attain in the course of the novel. I personally find Emma Bovary a very frustrating character. I often feel I just want to give her a slap. She's a really annoying character. But when Flaubert wrote his novel, so many women in France felt that they were Madame Bovary. 
They sent Flaubert letters and said, you have described me exactly. How did you manage to get into my heart and my mind in the way that you have done? So there's no doubt that Flaubert was tapping into a huge amount of feminine frustration and unhappiness and the feeling of being trapped in their married lives. So we have a look at this absolutely gorgeous little village of Ri, and we follow in the footsteps of Madame Bovary. We learn about the woman who might have inspired the actual story, the woman who ended up committing suicide, just as Emma Bovary does. And it is a truly gorgeous place to wander around. So even if you're not particularly fascinated by Madame Bovary, you can still enjoy this absolutely glorious French village. So from there, we move on to explore in greater detail the life and the works of Gustave Flaubert. And we visit the hospital where he was born. Now, most babies at that time were born at home. They were not born in a hospital. But Flaubert's father was a doctor and the family lived in quarters that were right next to the hospital. Hence, Flaubert was born in 1821 in a hospital. And the apartment within the hospital is today the really fabulous Musée Flaubert, or the Flaubert Museum. So we go into the little garden, which is very attractive, and we see the apartment of this truly extraordinary French writer who not only wrote that great novel, Madame Bovary, but who wrote some of the most wonderful short stories ever penned in the French language. His Trois Contes, or his Three Tales, are truly magnificent pieces of writing. So we learn more about Flaubert, his life, his loves, which were quite extraordinary, and, uh, of course, how he came to write his great works. Now, as a young boy, he would climb one of the trees just outside of the operating theater, and he would watch his father performing operations within the hospital. Those operations were all performed without any anesthetic in those days. The young boy could hear the screams of the patients. He could see the blood and gore on his father's apron. So when he came to write Madame Bovary, in many ways, he was a surgeon himself. He was sort of anatomizing the human condition and the human heart. And this is quite a famous cartoon of Flaubert digging his scalpel into the character of Madame Bovary and holding up on the end of the knife the heart that he has taken from her body. So it really is fascinating to see the birthplace. He was probably born on that little bed that you see there in the truly excellent museum, the Flaubert Museum. And you can see portraits and all sorts of things connected with the family and learn more about him. His father was very disappointed that his son became a writer. He wanted his son to become a doctor like him. And he thought, you know, what's the use of literature? There's no point to it. It's not achieving anything. And yet, of course, the name Flaubert is only remembered today, not because of the doctor father or the doctor older brother, but because of Gustave Flaubert, who became one of the great novelists of all time. Flaubert Museum, by the way, is in the wonderful city of Rouen. But just outside of Rouen, he had a, a place that the family used uh, in order to escape the smells and the, uh, the pollution of the big city. And this was a little place called Coisse on the River Seine. The house that you can see in the picture no longer survives. But this was where Flaubert spent a lot of his time and where he did much of his writing on Madame Bovary and his wonderful short stories. So we visit the property, uh, even though that main house is gone, the little garden room where he loved to do a lot of his writing is still there. So it's a tiny little room right by the Seine and this pathway that you can see in the picture was known as Flaubert's shouting ground. Now, when he was having trouble thinking of the, exactly the right sentence for his novel, he would wander out of his writing room and he would walk up and down his shouting ground and he would shout out his sentences to the fishermen that were passing by on the River Seine. 
And if he felt they sounded right, then he would stick with them. But if they weren't quite right, he'd try again. And the next day, he'd shout out something different. He spent years and years and years writing Madame Bovary. And Flaubert is today regarded as one of the great stylists of French literature. He had to make sure that every single word was exactly the right word that he needed. So to visit this little writing room in Coisset and to see his desk there and to get a sense of the work that he did in that tiny room is very fascinating indeed. And there you can see his chair uh, where he sat at the table and some of the things that are there on display in this tiny little writing room at Coisset. Now, one of the things that Flaubert wrote while he was there was his fabulous short story, Un Coeur Simple, or A Simple Heart. It's about a young maid who gets herself a parrot. She has a very lonely life, but she has this parrot in a cage and she really falls in love with the parrot. Sadly, the parrot dies, but she has it stuffed and she continues to talk to the stuffed parrot and to feel that the stuffed parrot is very much a part of her life. It's a wonderfully moving story. What it has, however, resulted in is something known as the, the Battle of the Parrots, because in the Flaubert Museum in Rouen, there is a stuffed parrot that that museum says is very definitely the stuffed parrot that inspired Flaubert. But when you visit the little writing house in Quasse, there's another stuffed parrot, and they tell you it is very definitely the stuffed parrot that inspired the story. So Julian Barnes has written a wonderful book called Flaubert's Parrot about the conflicting stories of the parrot. Uh, it's very fascinating. And of course, we discuss that on the tour and we get to see both parrots and we can make up our own minds, which is the genuine an article. So it's a very fascinating way of following Flaubert in France. Now the museum in Rouen is also a medical museum because Flaubert's father and his brother were both doctors at a time when medicine was starting to change enormously. So there are, I have to say, some slightly gruesome exhibits as to medical history and how it was administered, how medicines were administered in Flaubert's time and how he uses medical issues within his novels. In Madame Bovary, a character needs to have his leg amputated. So there are a lot of medical issues within Flaubert's fiction. To see the Museum of Medical History is a very fascinating, if, as I say, slightly gruesome museum to visit in the wonderful city of Rouen. There's a statue in Rouen of Gustave Flaubert. Usually there's a pigeon sitting on his head, uh, but we go and have a look at the statue and we pay tribute to this uh, absolutely extraordinary writer within French literature. Now, the great city of Rouen is also, of course, connected with a wonderful artist. And I do this tour with the artist David Henderson, and he adds an enormous amount to the tour by taking us through wonderful art galleries and explaining the art that we see along the way. And one of the places you can see is the building where Claude Monet ended up doing so many fabulous pictures of Rouen Cathedral. In the 1890s, he painted this building over 30 times. Here you can see just two of the examples of this magnificent cathedral painted by Monet. So to go and see that spot which, where so much great art was created and to go through the cathedral itself, another building important in Madame Bovary, is a really magical experience. Now, we also visit this very charming little French village. It's called Ville les Roses, and it's in Normandy. And we spend a wonderful time exploring some of the villages of Normandy. This, unsurprisingly, was also a village that inspired many artists. Répin, Peplo, Maurice, Dumas fils, the writer, Michelet, 
Alexis Bouvier and Victor Hugo were some of the writers that were connected with this wonderful village and were inspired by it. So we take a gorgeous walk around the village in the footsteps of both artists and writers. And it truly is a very, very pretty place, as you can see from these pictures. Not too far away is this wonderful little church at a place called Varangeville sur Mer. And this was painted many times by Monet, by Renoir, and by many other places. And the church itself is absolutely fabulous to visit and to get those views of the, of the cliffs of, of Normandy uh, and to learn something more about the artists who were inspired by this spot is very special indeed. Now, I'm particularly excited about doing this tour next year because for the very first time, I'll be getting inside this building. And this is called the Chateau de Miro Mesnil. And this is almost definitely, there is a little bit of doubt about it, the birthplace of probably the greatest short story writer to have ever lived. And that is Guy de Maupassant. His story, The Necklace, is often regarded as the perfect example of a short story. And it's hard to think of any short story that could be better than The Necklace. But so many of his short stories, Ball of Fat and uh, uh, the, the Little Piece of String, they are really, really wonderful examples of the short story. Guy de Maupassant did write a couple of novels and they're perfectly readable and enjoyable, but it was in the form of the short story that he absolutely excelled. So almost certainly he was born in the chateau. We're going to be enjoying dinner in the chateau at the end of our visit. So I'm very excited indeed about that visit. And there's uh, the gardens are famed. There's a, a wonderful old uh, cedar tree in the grounds. And there you can see Guy de Maupassant, his very impressive moustache. Tragically, he contracted syphilis and he died a terrible death. Uh, and he was not very old at the time of his death. But there's no doubt that he hugely enriched world literature with his utterly wonderful short stories. So that's going to be a very special experience indeed, visiting the Chateau de Miro Mesnil. Now we spend some time in and around Rouen, and just outside of Rouen is this gorgeous little house, which was the country property of the great French playwright Pierre Corneille. Uh, he's particularly famed for writing some of the great classic dramas of the, uh, the French theatre. Le Cid is one of his most famous plays. He lived in the, he was living in this, uh, in this place round about the 1680s. It's a very gorgeous farmhouse with a particularly charming little garden. And it's a wonderful museum to Corneille. Uh, there is another museum for him in the centre of Rouen. Uh, we're not going to be visiting that on this tour. But I think everyone will really enjoy this visit to this gorgeous, very charming little farmhouse and learning more about a really interesting man uh, who did a huge amount to change French theatre. So a very special visit indeed. One of our evenings in Rouen is a really memorable night. An American woman called Julia Child traveled to Rouen. And in this restaurant called La Couronne, she ate her first proper French meal. She fell totally in love that evening with French cooking. And of course, she went on to make her whole career based around French cooking and French cookbooks, as she educated Americans in the art of cooking in the French way. So we enjoy a truly magnificent meal. Don't eat any lunch that day. You simply need to have an empty stomach when you go to La Couronne. Uh, and we have some of the recipes that were so praised and loved by Julia Child. So it is a very special night indeed on the tour. Now we move on to a fascinating writer and another of the very towering figures of French literature, and that is Victor Hugo. Victor Hugo's life was a fascinating one. It was a very controversial one. He had to leave France for many years and live in the Channel Islands because he upset the government of the day. But this is a beautiful home called the Maison Villequier. 
And it was here that Victor Hugo's daughter, who was named Leopoldine, uh, she married into this family. And very tragically, Leopoldine drowned with her new husband only a very short time after they were married on a nearby lake. Uh, they were out rowing on the lake. The boat overturned. Of course, neither of them could swim. Leopoldine was in big, heavy Victorian clothing, which pulled her down. And Victor Hugo was utterly devastated by the loss of his daughter. He was unable to write for a long time after this devastating tragedy that took place in the year 1843. So we visit this home that was very familiar to Victor Hugo and, of course, to his daughter, and we learn more about this really fascinating man of French literature. André Gide was once asked, who is the greatest poet in the French language? And his response has become quite famous. He said, Victor Hugo, alas, alas. He did not like to admit that Victor Hugo, who was a very complex, difficult personality, was actually the greatest poet in the French language. But because the poetry was so wonderful, he felt he had to give him first place, even though he didn't really like doing it. So we learn more about Victor Hugo in the course of the tour. His poetry, of course, his hugely influential novels, Les Miserables, The Hunchback of Notre Dame, so many other wonderful books that he ended up writing. We move on from there to the coast to a beautiful spot called Etretat. And Etretat will be familiar to anyone who loves great Impressionist art because it was painted many times by Monet and by many others of the Impressionist group. So this is one of Monet's paintings of the rather extraordinary cliffs at Etretat. The English writer Algernon Swinburne spent a lot of time there. Guy de Maupassant had a home at Etretat, which we will be visiting. Uh, so it is a place very strongly connected with both artists and with writers. And also in the vicinity, we visit the home of a man called Maurice Leblanc, which is in Etretat itself. Now, the name may not immediately ring any bells for you, but he created a famous character called Arsène Lupin. And some of you may have seen the recent series, I think it's on Netflix, called Lupin, uh, which is, of course, based on the gentleman thief that Maurice Leblanc created. So another very interesting museum to visit to learn something about uh, the detective novels featuring Lupin. We also go on to the seaside resort of Deauville, and this is the famous promenade at Deauville. Now, if you were anybody, you needed to be seen on this promenade, appropriately dressed with the right people, walking up and down with nothing else to do. So we will enjoy a walk on the promenade. How appropriately dressed I think we will be is another matter. We might all be in very comfortable footwear rather than in extremely elegant clothing. But this is a place connected with Coco Chanel. She opened one of her very first stores in Deauville. And Marcel Proust knew the area extremely well. So we will follow in their footsteps and we will promenade at Deauville. And there you can see the Casino Royale at Deauville. Uh, this, or the Casino, uh, this becomes Casino Royale in the James Bond novel of that name. Uh, so one of those great casinos in France that attracted the, uh, the glittering, the famous, the moneyed, and those who perhaps did not have very much money when they actually left the building. So a very fascinating place indeed. Just along the coast from Deauville is Cabourg, and this is a place that became very much loved by Marcel Proust. Now, I think everybody knows the name of Marcel Proust, but whether they have actually read In Remembrance of Things Past or In Search of Lost Time, those are the two titles that are given to his famous novel, which is in seven volumes, if I remember correctly, most people have not read Proust, but it is a really memorable and a really worthwhile experience. 
So what I do try to encourage people who are coming on this tour to do is to read Proust's work uh, because I think you get so much more from seeing the places that are connected with him. So he changes the name of Kaburg to Balbek in his novels. And many of his characters come here, they promenade, they go swimming in the ocean, uh, they eat at the magnificent hotel that we will also be visiting on the tour. And uh, so this is very much a, a literary landscape connected with Marcel Proust. Now, we do some wonderful Proust explorations on this tour. This is the town of Ilie Combre. Now, to begin with, this town was simply called Ilie. But after Proust turned it into the town of Combre in his novel, and it's where the novel begins with the famous scene of dipping a, a madeleine cake into a cup of lime tea, the town felt that they had to change the name. So it actually changed to Ilie Combre because it was used as a setting by Marcel Proust. And there are not that many towns which have changed their names because of a novel. So this is a very important literary site indeed. Uh, and there you can see it at the time when it was simply Ilie. That's the, the marketplace on an old postcard of, of Ilie. But this was a town that Proust was very familiar with as a boy. He used to come and stay with relatives there. He came out from Paris. When he saw the church tower, he knew he was getting to this place that he loved so much. It was hugely important in his novels. There's Proust, uh, a complex difficult character, suffered from very, very severe asthma all his life, which kept him inside a huge amount of the time. He, he struggled with pollen and other things that gave him you know, a terrible asthma. But we follow in his footsteps around the town of Ilie Combre in a truly memorable literary journey. That's the spire of the local church that he would see as he approached the town on the train. And he knew that he was going to enjoy a wonderful holiday once he got there, which is why he memorialized this place as Combre in his novels. Now, this is one of the most important literary buildings in the whole of France. And this is the home of Tante Leonie or Aunt Leonie. This is where the famous incident with dipping the madeleine into the cup of tea takes place in one of those upper bedrooms. This is a setting for a huge amount of the beginning of Proust's great novel. So it is today a wonderful Proust museum and a very important place to visit. So you can see the dining room, which Proust describes in great detail with that green lamp hanging over the table, and the servant serving various dishes on the table to his aunt and his uncle and the young boy, Proust. You can see the kitchen where the maid works and where Proust comes down those stairs in order to sit in the kitchen and experience the warmth and the more relaxed atmosphere that there is in the kitchen in comparison with the upstairs rooms. This is the stairway leading to the upstairs bedrooms and the young Proust does not want to go to bed so he goes very reluctantly up the staircase and then you get dozens of pages of the novel describing how he tries to settle in bed to get comfortable to go to sleep. It truly is an extraordinary novel. If you haven't read Proust, then I can recommend it as one of life's most interesting experiences. And this is the bedroom where Tante Leone has her cup of lime tea and the madeleine. And the novel really begins when Proust, in another part of the world, he's, he's in Paris, I think, uh, dips a madeleine biscuit or little cake, they're shell-shaped cakes, into a cup of lime tea, and suddenly it brings back all the memories of his childhood. So it's one of the most important food moments in all of literature. And he's remembering his aunt in this bed, dipping her madeleine into her cup of lime tea. And really the whole of his huge volume novel comes from this moment of dipping the cake 
into the tea. So seeing this bedroom where it all originally happens is a very special experience indeed. The first of the novels, In Search of Lost Time or Remembrance of Things Past, is divided up into separate books. So the first of the novels is Swan's Way. And there you can see one of the little Madeleine cakes. They're scallop shelled from the uh, Santiago de Compostela route, uh, where people doing the pilgrim's route had little scallop shells. So the cake is based on all of that. But it really is one of the most important food moments in all of literature. This is a magnificent chateau nearby. It's called the Chateau de Villebon, which we visit on the tour and we meet the man who's lucky enough to own the chateau. He tells us of the extraordinary story of his grandmother who faced the Nazis when they invaded the chateau and she faced them very bravely. And this is a chateau that appears uh, very frequently in Proust's great novel. Uh, so it's an important building for his novel, but a building with a fascinating history and one that is well worth visiting on the tour. We also visit this beautiful little garden in Ilie Combray. It was actually established by Proust's uncle. That's a little archer's house, a sort of medieval archer's house where you can shoot arrows from those, uh, those windows. It's an English style garden and it is very beautiful indeed. So we have a lovely stroll through the garden. Uh, and there you can see a couple more pictures of this beautiful spot where Proust used to sit in the trees as a boy and read novels to entertain himself. And just outside of the garden are the hawthorn hedges uh, and Proust writes very lyrically of the hawthorns in his novel. So there's a spot where all the hawthorns are growing beautifully and there are two different paths and this is another thing that Proust writes of in the novel, which path should one choose? So seeing those hawthorns I think is very special. And of course, every cafe in town claims to be the one that produced the original Madeleine that Tante Leone ate. So there's great rivalry in the town as to who actually produced the, the famous Madeleine. So a bit of a quote from Proust. I think this sums up the tour that uh, we need to see things with new eyes or through the eyes of great writers. So it's very special following Proust around France. Now, this is a very gorgeous place and perhaps more fashion centered than literary. This is the Dior Museum in the town of Granville. Now, Dior was one of the great fashionistas of French history. There's a very interesting new book out about his sister called Miss Dior by Justine Picardy. Uh, so we'll be discussing that to some extent and, and what happened to her. So a really lovely visit to the home of one of the great couturiers of French fashion. This is a gorgeous town called Fougere. Here we go for a guided walk in the footsteps of Victor Hugo and also Honoré de Balzac, another of my great favourites amongst the wonderful French writers. This is the Chateau de Vitre. This was the home of one of the most famous letter writers of French history. Her name was Madame de Sévigné, and she wrote letters to her daughter, and they have all been published. So this is a building associated with her. We'll learn more about this really fascinating correspondent in French history. Another interesting chateau that we visit is the Chateau de Combourg. This was the birthplace of René de Chateaubriand, another of the great romantic writers of the 19th century. Uh, he also, interestingly, gave his name to the Chateaubriand steak. So many of you may have ordered a Chateaubriand steak in a restaurant, but he's famed for much more than just a piece of meat. So we will be learning more about this great romantic writer of the 19th century. We then move on to Honoré de Balzac, here in one of the many portraits that were done of him during his life. A marvellous novelist who created the great Comédie humaine, or the human comedy, a huge range of novels that cover all aspects of French history, French culture in the 19th century. A fascinating man, uh, used to dress like a monk, but certainly never behaved like one. <laughs> 
a uh, couple of his novels, Eugenie Grande, one of my favourite French novels, the story of a miser and his daughter, a deeply moving book, Le Père Goriot, another of his great works, uh, so a truly wonderful French novelist. And there he is dressed in his monk's robe. He had affairs with many, many different women. He had constant financial problems, a truly incredible, extraordinary man who wrote for something like 18 hours a day, fueled by coffee. But I don't know how happy he ever actually found himself. But one of the places we visit is a place that I think is very special indeed. It's the beautiful Chateau de Sachet in the Loire Valley. This was not owned by Balzac. It was owned by friends of his, but he was always very welcome to go and stay there. So whenever he got into debt in Paris or he just needed a break, uh, he would go and stay at Sachet and he wrote many of his novels in his bedroom or his study in this truly gorgeous chateau. So I love visiting this place. There he wrote Lee dans la Vallée or The Lily in the Valley. Here you can see part of the manuscript. His manuscripts were always a complete mess crossings out, changes. They were truly extraordinary. So we'll see some of those on display. He drank many, many, many cups of coffee every day to keep himself going. Eventually, when coffee stopped working properly, he just started chewing coffee beans to give himself the caffeine hit to keep going. So we see his desk, which he actually wore out with the movement of his arm over the wood, and we see one of his many coffee pots. This is the bedroom where he wrote. You can see his bed in the background and you can see the desk where he penned so many of his great works. And this is one of the things that the poor publishers had to cope with. So they would send him a proof copy and he would end up making dozens and dozens of changes. And eventually they started charging him for all the changes he made because it was just never ending work. And it was a complete nightmare for the publishers to try and work out what changes he was actually scribbling at the side of the manuscript. So it's really fascinating to see those original manuscripts on display. This is the lovely drawing room at the Chateau de Sachet where he would relax in the evening with his host and uh, hostess. The host had actually had an affair with his mother and might well have been the father of Balzac's half-brother. But that's one of the many stories that one gets in French literature. Nobody ever seems to have been faithful to anybody else for very long. Many, many statues of, uh, of Balzac and you see models of some of those on display. But my absolutely favorite statue in the entire world is this wonderful Rodin statue of Balzac, which stands in the Rodin Museum in Paris. Rodin was vilified for it. He was hugely criticized for what he had created. I think it's a truly magnificent statue that captures the absolute essence of Balzac. We see copies of it at Sachet, but you have to visit the Rodin Museum to see the original work in Paris. So there's Sachet and the lovely late afternoon light. Uh, we often have a picnic in the barn. We wander around the grounds by the river. It is a truly magical visit. Now, another visit that we have is to a female writer, and I haven't included that many of them in the tour, but this is the beautiful house called Noel, which is right in the middle of France, and it's the home of Georges Sand. Now, the name George might sound very masculine, but she was, of course, a woman, and she used the name of Georges Sand as her pen name. So there she is as a young woman, a truly extraordinary woman, very brave in many ways. She often dressed as a man uh, in order to experience the freedom of male clothing and a male persona. Uh, so we learn more about this really remarkable woman. She grew up at her grandmother's home, Noam, and there it is again. It was a home she loved deeply. She cared for many of the local people. She was known as the good lady of Noam because she was so kind to the local people. And we learn about her novels 
and also, of course, about her marriage. This is her husband, Casimir Dudevant. It was not a happy marriage. And we learn about her affair with another great French writer, Alfred Musset, and her affair with Frédéric Chopin. So here she is dressing as a man. She was definitely a, a rule breaker of the time and a truly fascinating woman. This was one of her best-selling novels of the day. George Sand is not much read today, but she was a towering figure of 19th century France. Everyone who was anyone read their Georges Sand. Another portrait of her, and we see many portraits around the house, and we learn more about her two children and her fascinating life. Here you can see some of the beautiful furniture. It's a gorgeous house. I could very happily move into Noant myself. I just love the house and I love the garden. Uh, and uh, there in the background, you can see the little piano that Chopin played. Uh, he, of course, was one of her lovers. He lived at the house for a long time. And as you wander around the house, they have Chopin's music playing, which I think is very appropriate indeed. So there's a portrait of her with Chopin. They did break up and tragically he died very young from tuberculosis, but it was an affair that was very important to both of them. So a really fascinating museum to visit. I'm particularly fond of the dining room where she entertained all sorts of famous visitors. So you know, she would have people like Alexandre Dumas fils and she would have some of the major critics of the day and Chopin was there and the artist Delacroix came for lunch. And those wine glasses, I've got a picture there, uh, or champagne glasses, were given to her by Chopin. And the shop for a while sold replicas of those glasses I bought some so I'm able to drink my champagne from a replica of a glass that Chopin gave to Georges Sand, which I think is rather special. So more lovely pictures of the home. It's, uh, uh, we have a guided tour through the house and we learn a lot about the, uh, the furniture, the history of the house, and of course, its famous occupants. Now, Georges Sand was fascinated by puppets, and she and her son created this wonderful puppet theater. So we get to see a lot of the puppets that are there in the museum. And you learn about the puppet shows that they put on, and people would come out from Paris, especially to see the puppet shows in this little private theater. So that's another rather fascinating thing to do. And there's the beautiful garden. Uh, it's lovely to stroll around the grounds and to see this truly gorgeous little chateau. And Georges Sand herself is buried in the grounds. So we're able to visit her grave within the grounds of the chateau. Now, nearby is a village called Gagiles. And this village is listed as one of the 100 most beautiful villages of France. Georges Sand was very fond of it, and she had a holiday house in the village. She liked going swimming in the river, a very unusual thing for a 19th century woman to be doing. So there's her little holiday house, which we visit. The, uh, the village today is, uh, is filled with artists and their artists' studios. So it's a wonderful spot to wander through the picturesque streets. Uh, but we also visit this little holiday house, which is another museum to Georges Sand. So a really special spot to visit. Nearby, we see a wonderful old water mill. This was the mill that she used as the, as the setting for her novel, The Miller of Angibo. And we also see that rather extraordinary castle, which she describes again as a setting in that same novel. So we don't go inside it, we drive past and take some photographs, but both places are very picturesque indeed. Not too far away is a little schoolroom. So we all go back to school one day and we visit the schoolroom that was the home of a writer called Alain Fournier, who wrote a very intriguing, mysterious, challenging, and in many ways quite difficult novel called Le Grand Mont. Now it's very rarely translated. Sometimes the great Mont, but that doesn't really do it justice. 
Uh, usually the title is given in French, even in an English translation. So it's really fascinating to visit the house connected with the schoolroom and to learn more about Alain Fournier and what is considered one of the great novels of 20th century France. Now, having visited the home of Georges Sand and learned more about her relationship with Chopin, we felt it was very important to include some music in the tour. And we're lucky enough to visit this ancient old barn and the home of Maître Cyril Uve, who is a truly magnificent pianist. And he gives us a private concert. What makes this concert so special is that he has five different grand pianos, all dating from different eras. And one of them is from the time of Chopin. So he will play the same piece on the different pianos and explain the different quality of sound and when the pianos were made, and he'll give us something of the history. So to finish our day of Georges Sand with a visit to this wonderful barn, to sit and have a glass of wine and listen to this beautiful concert when Chopin is being played is a very special evening indeed. We can't possibly ignore Colette, one of the great writers of 20th century France, and we have a wonderful visit to her home in the village of saint sauveur en puise where she was born in 1873. Another gender bender, a uh, fascinating woman, rule breaker, a woman who was a best-selling novelist. So we learn a lot more about Colette, who grew up in this beautiful home in France. We also learn about the great artist, writer, film writer, playwright, a man of so many talents. He was a real polymath, Jean Cocteau, one of the great 20th century artists. And we visit his beautiful home. It was the last home of his life in Mille le Flore, a really gorgeous spot, much beloved by Cocteau, where he retired with his cats and various lovers and his garden and his painting and his writing. So again, a very special visit to the home of Cocteau. We go to the home of Alphonse Daudet, a writer who came from the south of France. He never loved the north of France, but he had to spend most of his life there because of his writing and his contacts. But we visit this home in Drave, uh, which is today a centre for writing and storytelling. And we learn a little bit more about this fascinating writer from the south of France. And one visit I am particularly excited about because I've been trying to get into it for years, but it's been closed for renovations. So this is the first time I'm going to get inside the home of Emil Zola at the village of Medon, not too far from Paris. Now, Zola lived in Paris for much of his life. He was born in the south. And he set up this home at Medon uh, on the Seine River. And he would very frequently invite artists and writing friends to come and visit him there. And in the year 1880, he and a group of other writers published a very important volume of short stories called Soiree de Medon, or Evenings at Medon. And most of these writers were quite well established, but one was a young writer called Guy de Maupassant, who had never really written anything much before. And in this volume, or for this volume, he produced a story called Boule de Suif, or Ball of Fat. Zola read it, and he said, my goodness, the young blighter has surpassed us all. And from that moment, Guy de Maupassant's story took off. So it's going to be very exciting to get inside this house at Medon, learn more about Zola, who famously defended uh, Dreyfus in the Dreyfus case, and almost certainly lost his life as a result, uh, and to learn more about the evenings that took place in this very important house in Medon. Now, one of the people who often came to visit him there was his good friend, Paul Cezanne. And this is one of the paintings that Cezanne did of the little village of Medon. He liked to paint in a boat. He'd take his easel and his work out onto a little boat and he'd float along the river and he'd work on his painting. And on one occasion, a passerby said, oh, what's that you're doing? You're trying to paint? Oh, I'd advise you to give up. You're not very good. So a rather fascinating story about Cezanne painting at the little village of Medon. 
Now, we finish our tour with the writer with whom we began, Alexandre Dumas. And we're lucky enough this time to be staying in this truly gorgeous building. In the past, I've only been for lunch there with tour groups. But this time, we're actually going to stay in the Pavillon Henri IV, so the Pavilion of Henry IV. This building, there used to be a lot more of it, was the birthplace of the Sun King, Louis XIV. And so many famous writers have been to stay and also to eat in this building. Alexandre Dumas, Émile Zola, Dodé, and even King George V, when he came over from England, he would stay in this gorgeous building. So we're going to stay in this building as we do the very last explorations of our tour. And one of the places we go to is the Chateau Monte Cristo. Now, Dumas built this little chateau as a place where he could entertain his friends, not too far from Paris. He was so famous that the train quadrupled its income whenever Dumas was in residence and people came out to stay with him. It was not really a place on which to live. It was more just a place to entertain. And it is a truly magnificent little jewel box of a chateau. It has a Moorish room, so all done in the Moroccan style. In fact, the repairs for this room were paid for by the King of Morocco, who was a huge Dumas fan. And it is a magnificent place to visit. And this is where Dumas held parties, his housewarming party. He had 600 guests who came out from Paris, especially for the event. It's totally gorgeous wandering around this little Chateau de Monte Cristo. And the, as you can see, there are manuscripts on display. Dumas wrote a cookbook. He was very, very keen on food. So you get quite a lot about food as you're staying there. And I'll tell you an extraordinary story when we're there of a woman who spent a night with the dead body of Alexandre Dumas in this little chateau. It is a truly remarkable story. In the grounds, he created a little writing house. And here you can see the writing house. You can't go inside it, but it's so picturesque and pretty. And we learn about the pet vulture that he kept there. Uh, Dumas was an absolutely extraordinary man. And I think you will enjoy learning more about the man, his works, his legacy, and everything else when we visit this utterly gorgeous Chateau de Monte Cristo and its writing house. So that brings me to the end of some of the things that we will be doing on the literary tour of Northern France in May and June next year. This is a picture of the Bouquiniste alongside the Seine River in Paris. So although the tour itself does not spend time exploring Paris, you are, of course, totally at liberty to add a few extra days at the end of your tour or before the tour and spend time in that utterly beautiful city of Paris, which was so important to so many of the French writers that I have been discussing. So I hope that my talk this evening has given you an idea of some of the highlights of literary France, and there are so many of them. I have really barely scratched the surface this evening. Uh, I would love to have you join me on the tour next year. I believe there are still just a few places available, so it should be a beautiful time of year. I'm very excited about doing the tour, and I would really love to have your company exploring this most beautiful of countries and some of the greatest writers in all of world literature. Thank you very much for joining me this evening. I'm very happy to take questions if anyone has questions they would like to ask. If you have not signed up for my free monthly newsletter, Notes from a Book Addict, please just get in touch with me or look on my website and sign up there. So thank you for joining me. I do hope you've enjoyed the presentation this evening. So merci beaucoup and bon voyage for when you next go travelling with ASA. Thank Thanks, everyone. Much. So does anyone have questions they would like to ask? How is Zola's death attributed to the Dreyfus Affair? Oh, Zola died from poisoning from a fire.
and it's almost certain that the chimney was blocked up by a workman who was there a short time before, and this meant that there was poisonous fumes in the room when he went to sleep. Uh, his wife survived it. She was higher up, I think. The, I, I forget the order. One, one was on a bed and one ended up trying to get out of the room and fell to the floor. She was found and she survived. But the workman on his own deathbed confessed that he had blocked the chimney. So he And he was connected with the anti-Dreyfusards and Zola was much hated because of his support of, of Dreyfus. <laughs> so almost certainly he was murdered because he supported Dreyfus in, in a time of huge anti-Semitism in France. He actually had to flee the country. He had to go and live in England for, I think it was about two years because it was so dangerous for him in France. He loathed English food. He never learned the <laughs> English language uh, and he was not happy living in England, but uh, it was just too dangerous for him in France. So he had to yeah. leave. So he was a very brave man. He was the one who famously wrote that newspaper piece, Jacques, I accuse, mm -hmm. where he accused the military, the judges, everybody that was involved in the, the yeah. stitch up that was the, the Dreyfus yeah. case. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions anyone would like to ask? In the, the shot of the hospital, there's a horrible looking instrument on the extreme edge of the picture. <laughs> what on earth was that for? I can't remember what that was for. I think it might have been for hemorrhoids or something ghastly <laughs> like that. Oh, um, it is a very gruesome museum, particularly anything gynecological. <laughs> Uh, you know, to do with childbirth, it's just horrific. And you think, oh, my yeah. goodness, what those poor women went through. But it is a fascinating museum. ASA in the past has done some medical history tours. And, of course, that museum was always included. But some of the items you don't want to look too closely at because they really are a bit grim. But it certainly reminds you of how difficult medicine was then, how ignorant many of them were. Yeah. and how Flaubert uses medicine very interesting ways in his novels. So uh, uh, it is a wonderful museum to visit, in spite of the, the slightly gruesome implements. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I do hope you will be able to join me, and uh, I'm really looking forward to doing this tour next year. Oh. So uh, and a big thank you to Cheryl, who, as always, has dealt with all of the technology, and particularly a thank you to ASA. Uh, the team there is just so remarkable. They really are. I, I just feel incredibly privileged to be working for a tour company that's as professional and so fabulous as ASA. Au revoir, merci beaucoup, and I hope I will see many of you in France next year. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much, Susanna. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Cheryl. Good night, everyone.